Let's review the Calvin cycle a little bit. Maybe I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than the last video. And uh, by doing that, we'll be able to appreciate an inefficiency, or what we think is an inefficiency, that occurs in many photosynthetic plants. So just a review of the Calvin cycle. You start off with some CO2. In the last video, I had six molecules of CO2 and six molecules of ribulose by phosphate. But in this one, just to show you that I could have literally just divided that last that last cycle by two, I'm going to start with three and three. Three molecules of carbon dioxide, three molecules of ribulose biphosphate. If you don't remember what ribulose biphosphate was, it was just a five carbon, it was just a five carbon molecule. It had two phosphates on it. I can draw the phosphates. So you have a phosphate there. And you have a phosphate there. And we saw in the last video, and here I'm going to do a little bit more detail. And of course, carbon dioxide, there's only one carbon here. I, mean, I could just draw a carbon like that. I mean, yeah, I don't want to draw the oxygens right now. I just want to focus on just the carbons and maybe the phosphates. But in the last video, we saw that these two merged, or these two reacted. They reacted in the presence of ribulose biphosphate carboxylase, which is this enzyme. It was that big protein that I showed you in the last video. And it's called Rubisco for short. So I'm going to write, I'm going to put Rubisco in the middle of this whole cycle, because all of this is going on along with the Rubisco enzyme. These molecules are joining onto the Rubisco enzyme, and then the ATP and the NADHs are reacting on different parts. And that's essentially what's driving the whole reaction. So you have all of this is happening with that big Rubisco, Rubisco protein or enzyme, or whatever you want to call it. And this just stands for ribulose biphosphate carboxylate. So it's essentially telling you that it merges a, a, a carbon onto ribulose biphosphate. And the last video, I just, you know, I just did a very hand wave. I didn't show you all of the intermediates, but I showed you, look, if in this situation you end up using six ATPs and six NADHs, you'll end up with glyceraldehyde three phosphate or G three P, or that's also called phosphoglyceraldehyde. So you could also write it as P gal, but a very easy way to visualize it. It was just a three carbon chain with a phosphate, with a phosphate group. And in the last video, when I started uh, three carbon dioxides and three ribulose, or in the last video, I started with six carbon dioxides and six ribulose biphosphates, and I ended up with 12 of these. Now I have three and three, so now I'm going to end up with six of these. So I'm going to end up with six G3Ps. And the math works out, right? I have three carbons plus three times five carbons. That's a total of 18 carbons. And here I have six times three carbons, or 18 carbons. And that's what I showed you in the last video. But there are actually some intermediary steps. There are some intermediary steps. So the very first thing that's actually formed is 3-phosphoglycerate. 3-phosphoglycerate. And the whole reason why I'm showing you this detail, and maybe you're taking a biology class where they actually go into this level of detail, is I want to sh because this compound also gets produced in that inefficient cycle that we're going to explore in this video. So you get 3-phosphoglycerate, which is also a three-carbon chain, but it's a different one than this. And this isn't ready to produce glucose just yet. But you could also imagine that as a three-carbon chain with a phosphate group. And then, and of course, you're going to produce six of these, right? just to make sure all the carbon gets accounted for. You have 18 carbons here. You're going to have 18 carbons here. So you're going to have six of these three phosphoglycerates get produced. And then each of those get a phosphate from, a, from ATP. So you're going to have six ATPs come in. And remember, these ATPs got produced in the light-dependent reactions that occur in the, in the membrane of our, of our thylakoids. But anyway, we have these ATPs. You have six ATPs, and then they become six ADPs. So essentially, they've given away their phosphate groups, and they're going to give one phosphate group to each of these three, or sorry, to each of these six three phosphoglycerates. And then you're going to end up with this right here. I'm running out of space. I, mean, I didn't do it as neatly as I should have. But you're going to end up with this three chain carbon or three carbon compound. It's going to have two phosphates then. And this, you know, we can, you could know the name. This is 1,3-phosphoglycerate. 
by phosphoglycerate, right? This was just three phosphoglycerate, which means that the phosphate is on the third carbon. Now we have one three by phosphoglycerate. We have a phosphate on the one carbon and the three carbon. We have two of them, so it's by phosphoglycerate. And then so that's to get us right there. And then to get from the one three by phosphoglycerate, and of course we have six of these as well, right? Six of these turn into six of these. And to turn these six 1,3 biphosphoglycerates into our three uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphates, or phosphoglyceraldehyde. The names are very daunting. This is where we are actually going to. Uh, this is where we're actually going to oxidize our NADPH. Right? Remember, oxidizing is losing electrons or losing hydrogens with their electrons. Either way. So here, on this step right here, two things are going to happen actually. You're going to have six NADP NADPHs become six NAD pluses. So they're losing that hydrogen and the electrons. And also one ph phosphate is going to be lost from each of these uh, molecules. And then you're going to ha also have plus six of the phosphate groups. The phosphate groups don't get lost here. They get added onto these molecules right there. And then we add we we end up with our six glyceraldehyde three phosphates, which we learned in the last video, we can then use to produce fuel or, or glucose or other uh, carbohydrates in the cell. But we also learned that you know, this is the, called the Calvin cycle. So all of it doesn't get used to produce actual uh, glucose or other, or other uh, carbohydrates. Most of it, out of the six, five of them, five of them, are going to be used to produce our three ribulose biphosphates. So let me actually let me do it like this. So you're going to have five G3Ps go in that direction. So for every six G3Ps you produce, five go back into the cycle, and then one exits the cycle. We saw this in the last video. In the last video, I had 12 here, so 10 went in this direction and 2 went in this direction. I'm just dividing everything by 2 in this video. And the whole reason why I did it, uh, I multiplied by 2 in the last video, is so that we end up with 2 going into this direction, because 2 is enough to produce at least one glucose. But we don't have to have 2. We could just say we do this whole cycle twice to get 2. But anyway, I have one glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate coming out of this end. And then these five uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphates that stay in the cycle. Remember, those are just, you know, three carbons with a phosphate group. I drew it over here already. They will then use, they will then use another three ATP. So three. Let me write it this way. Three ATP. AT, ATP. So we end up with three AD. P's, and the phosphate groups actually end up on the ribulose biphosphate, and they get essentially recycled into ribulose biphosphate for the whole cycle to happen again. Remember, and all of this is happening, you can kind of imagine in or on the surface of this big enzyme, this ri ribulose biphosphate carboxylase. And actually, just so you, you uh, I guess, know a piece of terminology, this type of photosynthesis is called C3 photosynthesis. C3 photosynthesis. And the whole reason why it's called C3 photosynthesis is because the very first product that you get when you, uh, when you react with carbon dioxide, when the first time you fix your carbon dioxide, remember, carbon dioxide fixation is when you take it in its gaseous form and you're actually putting it into a molecule. The very first carbon molecule you get once the carbon dioxide gets fixed is a three carbon molecule. It's phosphoglycerate. That's why I showed it to you there, because that's where the C3 pho the three in the C3 photosynthesis comes from. Now, everything I've just done is a review of what we did in the last video, maybe with a little bit more detail. And I showed you that you don't have to start with six and six. You could start with three and three and just have five go down here and one go down here instead of doubling everything. But what I want to show you now is an inefficiency that goes on in plants. This Rubisco enzyme doesn't necessarily just fix carbon dioxide. It can also it can also react with oxygen. And actually, its name is ribulose biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, which means it can react with carbon or oxygen. And this mechanism, so let's say you have your ribulose biphosphate hanging around. You know, we're in the, stro we're in the uh, stroma of, some, of, of, our, of our chloroplast. 
So let's say we have our we have our five ribulose biphosphates. Five ribulose biphosphates. And instead of reacting with carbon, it can actually react with oxygen. So instead of having carbon dioxide here, I can have O2 coming in here. We have oxygen coming in here. And all of this, once again, is occurring on the surface or with the assistance of the Rubisco. I'll just, of the, the exact same, the Rubisco enzyme. Ribulose biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. That's why, because it can also fix oxygen. And when these two things react, you don't get useful things that can be used for fuel and all of that. The first you end up with, you end up with, and my drawing is a little messy. You end up with one, well, if these two guys react, you'll end up with five molecules, five molecules of this guy right here, five molecules of this 3 phosphoglycerate right there. Remember, here we ended up with six of them, but now we're only going to end up with five phosphoglycerates. Five phosphoglycerates. And I know the names are all very confusing. But the basic idea is to remember that what's happening here is, is carbon dioxide isn't getting fixed. Oxygen can get fixed. And you end up with five phosphoglycerates. And you actually also end up with five, it's called phosphoglycolate. I know these are very daunting names. And, Phosphoglycolate, which is a two carbon molecule, which makes sense because we only have five carbons to start with. This thing right here is a three carbon molecule. That's a three carbon molecule. And this right here is a two carbon molecule. So this right here is going to be a two carbon molecule and it has a phosphate group. So as you can imagine, in this situation, we're not going to be able to keep going forward and produce our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which we can then use to make up carbohydrates. We're stuck. We just have these five phosphoglycerates. And we're, or I mean, we, these can go on, and you know, some percentage of them, but you know, the, the ratios are all getting messed up. But you know, everything doesn't necessarily happen this cleanly in the cell. These things can go on, but we have one less being produced. And this thing right here, it's actually using up some of our carbon from our uh, ribulose biphosphate. And if this thing kept going up, all of our ribulose biphosphate is going to get eaten up. We're not going to be able to continue on uh, into this cycle over and over again. And actually, this is kind of a waste product. Right here, this is a waste product. Or we think it's a waste product. And this actually has to exit your chloroplast and actually get processed by other organelles in the plant cells. And these are called these, these kind of waste processing organisms or organelles in your cells. These are peroxisomes. Peroxisomes. I know there's a lot of complicated terminology here. But the important thing to remember in, in when when Rubisco fixes oxygen, this is actually called photorespiration. That's an important word to know. Photorespiration. All of a sudden, instead of being able to uh, carry forward with your Calvin cycle and, and produce a lot of sugar, instead, you're depleting your Rubisco. So this is a very bad process. This is going to get in the way of your Calvin cycle. And remember how important each of these, remember how important each of these G3Ps are. Right? Because for every turn of the Calvin cycle, or at least the way I did it, we only produce one G3P that actually gets uh, used for something useful. The other five G3Ps have to go back to produce Rubisco again. So you can imagine, you can Im or not Rubisco, to produce RUP, the ribulose biphosphate. Rubisco, of course, is the enzyme. So in this situation, we only have five phosphoglycerates to begin with. Maybe if we have our ATP or our NADH, we can convert these five you know, it doesn't have to go in this direction, but maybe we can convert these five phosphoglycerates into five uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphates, G3Ps. But then all of these are going to be used back to produce rub to produce our ribulose biphosphate. So to go from here to here, we actually had to use up ATP and NADH. And then to go from here to here, we had to use more ATP. But we went through this whole cycle, and we didn't produce anything in terms of useful things that can be used to you know, essentially sugars or carbohydrates that can be used to fuel or provide structure for the plant in any way. So this is a completely, or we think 
This is a wasteful process. Wasteful process. So it, you know, it, people wonder. You know, you don't when you look at a lot of biological systems, you don't see wasteful processes all the time. You, you would have said, well, you know, wouldn't the natural selection have selected against this? And some people believe that this is just a remnant from our evolutionary past, for or our plant's evolutionary past, where there wasn't a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, and if there wasn't a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, this was not that likely. Uh, th this wasn't was not that likely of an occurrence. But there are some people who actually believe. That no, this might actually have been selected for a natural selection because if there is a lot of oxygen hanging around in the cell, that oxygen, uh, you know, more than you need, that oxygen might actually react with your ATP and uh, and create other harmful compounds in the cell, and this might be a way of kind of sopping up the harmful oxygen that's actually uh, hanging around the cell. So who knows? But it's an interesting idea that you have this one enzyme that can react with ribulose biphosphate. And carbon dioxide, and if that happens, we just get our regular Calvin cycle. Or it can react with ribulose biphosphate and oxygen, and actually fix oxygen into these two molecules, especially the phosphoglycolate, which we think is a waste compound. And if you just went on and on in the Calvin cycle in this way, you will not produce any useful any useful sugars. So in the next video, what I want to do is study some plants that have been able to get by this photorespiration problem. And you can imagine, photorespiration could be a really big big deal, or uh, it could be very harmful in situations where, uh, uh, one, it's very important for a plant to be very productive of sugars. And it can also, we'll see, it can be a, a problem in, well, it's definitely a problem if there's a, a huge amount of oxygen content. But we're, in the next video, I'm going to show you plants that have gotten around this problem by, uh, instead of performing C3 photosynthesis, which is kind of the classic Calvin cycle that I just showed you, they perform C4 photosynthesis. And I'll show you what that means in the next video.